Hey there, I am super excited. Today I have a new success interview from my Unleash Your Greatness Within podcast. It was my privilege today to interview Sky Fagrell. My passion and my mission to help you unleash your greatness within. My heart goes out to the underdogs, that, that's on our way. If you think you can, go from good to great. Okay, let's motivate. Greatnesswithin.com. You see, it was great to have Sky on the Unleash Your Greatness Within podcast. And if you have followed my podcast for any length of time, you know that I only bring you the best of the best. We're talking thought leaders, we're talking best selling authors, CEOs that are changing the world, celebrities, and even professional athletes. And today was no different because I resonate with Sky's message. And just to give you a little bit of background, Sky is the founder of More Fit for Life. He's also the author of the best selling book titled More Fit for the Kingdom, which I hope you check out. But really, in this conversation, we talk about not only achieving our goals and achieving success, but also achieving happiness in life. And Sky lays that out for us in just a great way. So if you're watching this on my YouTube channel, hey, I remind you, hey, subscribe to my YouTube channel and make sure you click that notification bell so that you're the first to be notified when I come out with a new success interview like this one, or I come out with a motivational message. And if you subscribe to my podcast on iTunes, I say thank you. Or if you follow me on any other channel, hey, I appreciate having you a part of my community. So without any further ado, let's jump right into this interview with Sky Fagrell. Sky, welcome to the Unleash Your Greatness Within podcast. I am excited to be here, TJ. Hopefully I can help unleash some of my own greatness, maybe some of your viewers and uh, certainly help you get pumped up too. I'm excited to oh, do it. Oh, you will. And I think we should probably, I wanna have you give a little bit of your background, although I want the audience to know on the outset that I know your background because we are friends. And I thought I would just let the audience know that we met several months ago on the beaches uh, or on the beach of in La Jolla, California. I met your beautiful yeah. family and we just sort of hit it off. And I have read your book, which we'll get into. Powerful book and a lot of similar principles. And I think that's why we've become good friends is because we share a lot of these concepts. And so I can't wait for the audience to hear what you have to say in terms of the principles and ideas around success, performance, and so forth, and living a successful life. Um, your thoughts are powerful around that. So anyway, give us a little story about yourself, a little bit of your background, would you? Yeah, I'm so excited to be on this podcast with you, TJ. And just so your viewers know, like TJ's right, we started off, we met there on the beach and just you know, had some other people there that are, yeah. we intersected and, and uh, just, again, the connection on just common principles that uh, we both believe in. But, you know, a little bit about me, I grew up in, in California in the Bay Area and uh, just had a great childhood and life there. And uh, about 30 minutes from the beach, about 45 minutes from the Oakland Alameda County Coliseum, where my beloved Oakland A's play baseball and uh, just grew up a diehard A's fan. Mm. I, I love the, the A's to this day. And in fact, I did, you mentioned I got a best-selling book. I, I'm willing to trade that in for a contract to play with the A's. So I, I put that out there a few times and I still, Billy Bean hasn't contacted me, but if anyone knows him that's listening, I'm all in on that. I can help <laughs> unleash some of the Oakland A's greatness, but uh, I'm not going to hold my breath on that TJ, but anyway, big A's fan. Um, I have a great family. I've been married for about 20 years, four kids. I've got a, my oldest is heading into college here soon. So we're having a big transition in the family. And so I've got an 18 year old and uh, a 15 and 13 and a nine year old and uh, just excited, excited and happy about life. So yeah, that's kind of where I'm at right now. I um, enjoy teaching, working, consulting and uh, exercising. Those are some passions of mine. And and I'm just happy to be here with your audience and with you, TJ, to talk about some crucial principles I think will just bless people's lives and empower them. That, and that's the plan. And by the way, your family's a beautiful family and also kind and so forth. So the future is bright for sure for your kids. I know 
uh, you have kind of come up with this acronym or the, not an acronym, but this saying more fit for life. And your best-selling book is more fit for the, for the, for the kingdom, more fit for the kingdom. So, Hey, give us a little background understanding about where that comes from and what it's about. Right on. Yeah. The four, just so like it, for people that are maybe just listening or not viewing like the, the, when he's saying four, it's the number four. Yeah. And a, a, a big part of what I do and preach kind of all revolves around what I call the four factors of fitness mm. and it's intellectual fitness it's physical fitness, it's your social fitness and your spiritual fitness. And so those four things are kind of the basis of my consulting work. It's the basis of the book, More Fit for the Kingdom. A um, little background on that book. When I was in college, I was studying and I was, I was kind of ending my college career and I was getting my minor in coaching and teaching physical education while also taking some courses in religious education. And so I'm on two sides of the campus um, and learning, learning some similar things, but also where there were some exclamation points on one side of the campus, there were some question marks on others. I would be in the physical fitness department talking with these coaches and other athletes about how to gain strength or how to lose weight or whatever the fitness principle was. And there was exclamation point assurance. If you want to gain strength on your bench press, let's Let's do a little progressive overload that's not a little bit more weight over a series of weeks, over a long period of time, you're going to get stronger. If you want to lose weight, you know, let's reduce calories and increase cardio and things like that. Right. And it was very definitive. And then I'd walk over to the other side of campus and they were also interested in learning about strength, but it was spiritual strength. But instead of having the exclamation point, how do I gain, you know, spiritual strength in the physical education department, it was very clear. It seemed like in the spiritual educational department I was in, it was a little bit more muddy, but for me, having been, you know, I'm studying both. I'm thinking to myself, Hey, I think this principle here would work really good there. And, and so the idea was planted in my head as I was making these connections, I think I could really, this would really help people's lives to empower them. If they understood that they could take this tried and true physical fitness principle and apply it in their spiritual growth or in their intellectual or professional and that's where I really bought in, TJ, to the idea that, that true principles apply in a wide variety of circumstances. I know that's something we both share and believe in, but oh, I have just really, at first, TJ, I really thought it was like anecdotal evidence that just something I felt or, hey, I think this would work. But more and more I've gotten into it. And this has been like a 20-year process of studying and, and working with people applying these. The more I find it's not anecdotal, it's scientific. It's if, you're, if you really want to improve in life and you have found a principle that works good in one area, let's say it's, it's working good at home to help your family get connected. Yeah. It would also work great at the office probably to help that team get more engaged and, and vice versa. So my book that the bestseller was about how to gain spiritual strength, you know, for individuals and families using, you know, it's all about sports analogies and fitness. Oh, yeah, A lot of stories. It's awesome. Yeah. So it, that's what that's about. And, and other stuff's coming, you know, with the same idea, here's a tried and true principle we're probably familiar with. Check it out in your home or in your office, you know, or in your relationships, and uh, see how that comes. You know, I love that, and I think I, I think it's great that you're focusing on the principle side. So, oftentimes when companies, for example, I know bring you in or bring me in, right? I know that they sometimes lean toward, hey, teach us leadership principles, like it's a set of principles that are in a silo or a vacuum that you can learn separate from working on yourself. And one thing I think you're right, the research is showing more and more and more is if you want better leadership in your organization, then you have to develop better people and vice versa. And you can't separate the two. I remember I was coaching an executive one time that says, hey, TJ, I don't need to know all like the kind of personal stuff and the, you know, these things in my background and how I run my life and so forth. And I said, no, they do impact the way that you lead. And over time, I was able to show that person that those same principles, positive or negative, affect how you're leading in the organization. And what I see oftentimes is leaders will turn off that personal side. When is the personal side, these personal and livable, true, time-tested principles 
that will lead to more engagement in the office. Any thoughts around that? Yeah, hundred percent. I, I think sometimes people are surprised with the simplicity of some of the principles that would be presented to, to increase the engagement of their team or their productivity and so forth. And we're talking about things like, Hey, gather together and communicate, give positive feedback, you know, have a quarterly meeting where you address some of these things, help people set some goals. And they're like, well, you know, you know, this kind of, they almost feel like it's, you know, kind of foo-foo, fluffy things. Yeah, and you're like, right. hey, if you wanted to increase the productivity of the children in your own home, you know, w- would you just send out a memo to them and say, hey, here's what we're going to do? Or would you try to create some connectivity? Uh, you know, talk about the vision of the family and why we're doing the things we're doing. Those same things work in the office. You know, if people don't know what the company's vision or goal or plan is, they're going to have a hard time doing it. And what we found, and you see it all the time, TJ, is that a lot of times people are just kind of disengaged at work. They get into the mentality of punching the clock because there, there really isn't a connection to the workplace other That's than right. a paycheck. And, uh, and same things happens in families with, with parents, couples, teens, whatever. There's a disconnection because there's not really a family vision. Um, there's not really goals. There's not maybe a, a positive communication that's happening on a regular basis. And so kids drift or couples drift or an individual drifts because they're out of alignment with probably a pretty core principle that I think most people will relate to, but they just maybe push to the side. Hey, this isn't that important. That's right. And before you know it, they have a disengaged family or disengaged workforce, or they're out of alignment at the gym or spiritually because they've just neglected a a pretty basic principle um, that would really help enhance their life and empower it, um, unleash the greatness within. I love that. I was listening to you on a different interview and you were talking about how just real quick, because you've already touched on it right here, Sky, and I thought I would just draw attention on it. It's one of my notes here. You talk about how you should run your home the same way or similar to the way a Fortune 500 company runs their business. And you say there are four ingredients that can help improve performance, if I'm saying that right. Correct me if I'm wrong. But you say, number one, you need to have, a, and I'm going to have you speak in more depth for each one of these, a vision statement. Number two, have daily huddles. Number three, effective gathering time periods to set goals and strategize. And then number four, hold annual conferences that refocus on the vision. Anyway, I might've said too much there, but here, please break that down for us. I think that's beautiful. You know, I, the first little caveat though I'd share is that sometimes when people hear me present this idea of like, Hey, have your family function like a fortune 500 company. They're like, what do you want? We want to have a big boss. We want to have oh, some cold good. relationship between employees. And, and so my clarification there is, yeah. Hey, I, I would hope that's not actually happening in the corporation anyway, right. but that's not the part. If it is that we're trying to duplicate, love it. But these fortune 500 companies are losing $500 billion a year in disengagement <laughs> issues. And so they've put a lot of time and effort into trying to figure out what they can do to increase that engagement. And so as I've studied them and also studied what effective families do, I found that these are some principles that really work across the board. Yes. Um, So one of them you mentioned is having a clear vision statement. And most families don't do this. They kind of, I guess, suppose that we're, well, we're working toward family togetherness. And like that, that's, that's really a great thought, but unless it's actually been counseled upon and agreed upon and, you know, and blazoned upon the wall or something, it's, it's not likely really moving people toward it. Mm -hmm. And so at the same time, sometimes companies put, you have a vision statement on the wall and no one really knows what it is either. And so having it written on the wall, isn't really the key, but having a collaborative effort in creating it is crucial. I mean, families that sit down, what are we going to do? What's our vision? You know, how would we word that? How would we make it t-shirtable, you know, Mm where we could put it on a t-shirt or something that process of gathering people's thoughts and ideas of, of what is our statement. And just in case if you were, you know, this is like the company's dream or a family's dream, like what they is going to govern their activities and actions, kind of a, a sermon in a sentence that they could say, you know, like Nike, just do it, you know, mm-hmm. like, and, and the families could say something in the Fagrell family, ours is stick together. And we say that and the kids know right away, okay, we need to get back on board and, and support and love one another mm-hmm. toward the family goal, family vision. Yep. You know, the next thing with that, and again, these kind of, I think, go in order, it, you know, we have a vision. And then you have a daily huddle and different families do that. Some religious families might meet and they do prayer or scripture or meditation. And when I say families, that could be one person to 20 people, TJ. When I, I'm using family pretty loosely here, but even an individual or a couple, 
having a vision of what they want to do and then meeting on a daily basis personally or with the kids, with the spouse and kind of going over the agenda, the plan. Companies that do this, they meet in the morning. Sometimes they do it on the phone or on a Zoom call, a group. And maybe it's just even a text. Here's the major plans for the day. Here's some instructions to remember. Here's our overall vision. Let's make sure we're, we're directing toward that, you know, customers first, quality service, whatever they're working toward. Can I, can, just, I, can, I give a, can I give an example of that is when I interviewed Horst Schulze, who's the co-founder of the Ritz-Carlton Hotels. I mean, he shares in the research I did on him, and then I had him on the Unleash Your Greatness Within podcast. And he said, every day at the turn of a shift, they have 24 values that they review. It takes about 10 minutes to do. No matter where you're at in the world at a Four Seasons hotel, everybody pauses with their manager, supervisor, whatever, and everybody stops. They review those 24 points on how they're going to have exceptional customer service and, and blah, blah. So what it does every day, it helps the players on the team remember what they stand for, the traditions that they believe in, what our values are, what our vision is, what we're trying to move toward. And I totally agree with you. That same thing, not exactly the same. I want to give the wrong image, but that constant communication of where we're heading and what our values are and, and how do we, what does that mean? What does living in integrity look like as a family, according to our vision, our values and so forth, having that conversation repeatedly daily with the family kind of a check-in I think is really powerful so I support that oh, idea yeah. yeah yeah you know and I I sometimes I met with a, a management team of a, of a pretty important company in the United States and was surprised I was really impressed with they had a vision statement and, and I'm not even getting into it here but value statements often follow or yeah you know, family right. Rules. right but uh, I was I came in you know to, to my gig having memorized them really impressed and and then when during the time that we were there together was kind of discouraged a bit because the management team didn't even know what they were. Yeah, I've seen. Because I was asking, how, yeah. when you're hiring, how are you incorporating these? Yeah. Well, wh which ones? What are you talking about? And it was more they were kind of stumbling about. It was more of you know a matter of chance that if they met a, if they had a hire that met those rather than we're going to hire people that buy into this or that we see that could grow into this. Right. So you know after a family or a team has has this you know they got a vision statement. And they're having daily huddles. Again, a daily huddle is 10 to 15 minutes. It's, it's families can get together just like a company would in different ways. Right. But they're reviewing what the vision is and what the plan is. It's really important to set and strategize how are we going to individually make goals to get there? Mm -hmm. You know, companies would have a different role, different parts, but here's our vision. Here's our values. Here's what we want for sales or whatever that company is trying to get to. So what's your goals to get there? You know, individuals, would be well suited to not just set it in one area. Sometimes families may get too focused on one thing, how we're treating brothers and sisters. Companies might get focused on one thing, um, just our, their professional work. Mm -hmm. But I would tell either side, like, hey, help your employees set goals, not just for the workplace, but really encourage them and, and incentivize that they work on stuff that's important to them spiritually or physically, socially. Again, an employee that's not got it going right at home or in the gym um, is spiritually, they're going to be out of alignment in the workplace too. And so even if the employer is just looking bottom line, it's in his best interest to learn to care about all four areas. Yes. Something with parents or individuals, you know, if you are wanting to progress in the gym, it's crazy, but it would also probably do you well to identify an area to grow in the other areas. And you'll find that it, there's just, you see progress in one of those four factors. It's motivating. Hey, I'm using this principle. I'm going to keep this diligent effort, you know, intense, intense effort in the gym and also get results. So some kind of a quarterly or monthly like business meeting, the world would call it, but in your family, you, you maybe have, like, I'm going to sit down with the family. We're going to see how we did in the goals. We're going to recognize achievement, see where we maybe fell short, coach each other up. It's an awesome practice for families too. Right. And then number four, annually do the same thing, right? Annually check yeah. in. You know, I would say that annual conference though, TJ, that's like where we met up in La Jolla. Yeah. Like I brought family down there. We, you know, tie a theme to, you know, something like that, where it's maybe a little bit different than just a monthly or quarterly business review. It's your annual conference and where, you, you know, you 
you're doing other things, but maybe you wrap it around a theme and make an already pre-planned family vacation into a, a corporate event where you're really, you know, driving home a, a message that you wanted the, the family to know. No, I love, I love these ideas. And it just goes back to just to remind the listener that principles are principles. And if you use them in the, in the business, you can use them in your family and using them in your family can affect the business and so forth. I love that you point out the intellectual, the physical, the spiritual, the social. I wrote a note down on my paper that says, this is really the whole person approach. That's what this is about. It's about living a full life by integrating each one of those, you call them four factors of fitness. I call them uh, the four motivations. Stephen Covey calls them, right? The four endowments, if you will. I've heard him say that. Yeah, I don't I don't claim to be the inventor of these. Like, I think that they're tried and true principles that like, Clearly, uh, yeah. Throughout time, like you can find elements of these in ancient scripture. You can find them in hundred percent, hundred percent. Well, families that are functioning well maybe have stumbled upon them, or maybe intentionally doing them. But this, you know, kind of this wellness wheel, TJ. Sometimes you see them, and there, there's so many pieces of the pie where someone's labeled these things. I find if you just keep it to these four, almost every other attribute that an individual or family or company may be wanting to work on could be footnoted to one of these. And, and that's why they've been so powerful for me personally or in my, in my work with other people and companies is that, hey, we can all find something here that's meaningful, that's personal, that we actually want to make improvement in. And then when that starts being made, I, it's just, it gets contagious. Other people see it in the it office of the family and, and there's growth that comes, real growth. Okay. Let's talk about your book, right? More Fit for the Kingdom. Tell us the story in the beginning. I remember reading it. About Lindsay Jacob Ellis. Yeah. yeah. Man, I love this athlete. And, and really, for anybody that ends up reading the book, know that by the end, I she's my hero of the book. Okay. Oh, and so okay. I, I come back to her at the end chapter two. But most of your viewers, I'm sure that there, there's a diverse crowd here. But I know you've had athletes on here before. Mm -hmm. And uh, these kind of stories aren't foreign to your viewers. But Lindsay Jacob Ellis is an X Games athlete. She's a snowboard crosser. And she's kind of the Babe Ruth of snowboard crash. Like she's won more than anybody. She's world renowned. Huh. However, I, I, and then this is where I, I, I feel bad. And if Lindsay, if you're ever listening to the show, I'm sure you're a big fan of TJ's. <laughs> I think you're the best. Okay. But uh, Lindsay, unfortunately, hasn't ever won a gold medal in the Olympics. And infamously, unfortunately, at a moment in her first Olympics, when the X, X Games was finally put in, or the X Games wasn't, but they made snowboard cross an Olympic event. She was out front in the gold medal round, and to the second to the last jump, she went up, she got excited. She pulled a trick that's not really complicated. For me and you, TJ, it would be very complicated, mm -hmm. but for her, it was just a basic method grab. Okay. And unfortunately, she lost balance in the air. She came down, she spun out the second place finisher that was like 30 yards behind, passed her. And as Lindsay got her board right and made it toward the finish, she saw the other athlete winning the gold that could have been hers. Now, again, a silver medal in the Olympics, TJ, for you and I, I would love to have a silver medal in the Olympics, right. but to have the gold medal that close. And I start that story in my book to become more fit for the kingdom to just point out that she had an opportunity that she may never get back. And unfortunately at this point, she's competed in multiple other Olympics and it's just been tragedy after tragedy, mm -hmm. getting disqualified, hitting another athlete, you know, getting fourth place by fractions of a second. And I'm rooting for her to, to win. Again, I, I come back to her in my book at the end and, and she is really what it means to become more fit because she's never given up. Mm -hmm. But there's a real great lesson to be learned about when these opportunities come uh, we need to be prepared to take them and understand that there are forces in life, whether you're in the business world or spiritually or in a family that's trying to tear you apart, tear you down. And if we're not careful, it can succeed. If we, if we lose focus, we can be brought down when the gold medal's in reach. Love it. You talk about our efforts at improvement in any area of fitness are enhanced as we focus on improvement on all four areas of fitness that triggered a thought in me 
when I was a young boy listening to Jim Rohn, he would always say, everything affects everything else. Nothing stands alone. And so I agree. He would always say something to the effect of, if you need to exercise more and you haven't gone for a run, maybe you start by eating an apple a day. And maybe eating the apple a day will get you started on running around the house. And maybe it'll go from running around the house to running a block and then eventually a half a mile and then maybe a full mile. But you got to start. Right and, they, and they do affect everything else. Absolutely. Yeah. An individual that comes in and they might have a real glaring, uh, one of the four factors that they really feel uncomfortable with. And they want, like, let's say it's weight loss. Like they, I, I just don't mm. feel comfortable. I'm not where I want to be. It starts impacting maybe their profession too. They, they just feel they don't have energy at work. It's maybe infecting the relationship. They weren't mm. as active as they could want to be with their kids. It, it's, it's impacting their spirituality. They just, they can't get up to do those things that previously brought them spiritual alignment and joy. And so it would be one thing for a coach or a trainer to just say, Hey, let's work on that weight loss. Yeah. But for a more long lasting whole approach, yeah. say, Hey, what are the other areas that you're concerned with? Why don't we, we let's not put too much on the truck here and, and low you down, but let's, let's choose a, an incremental goal here, a reasonable attainable goal that you could establish that while you're also working to lose weight, you could also get in alignment with these other areas you're going to now find an employee or a partner or a kid that is making progress much quicker and much more well-rounded and much more long lasting than if you just try to put a bandaid on that one thing. So true. So true. That's sustaining results, right? Um, yes. And when people are integrated with these four factors, these four human needs, these four focuses, whatever they are, um, not only are you achieving great results, right? But you're also um, finding fulfillment in the process, right? You and I both know leaders and people that are high achievers who are really good, let's say making money or really good with getting results and becoming the CEO of a company or whatever else. But I know in my case, I don't mean to speak for you, but in my case, I've met with many of them who are really unhappy. And when you talk to them on a private level, an individual level, I find myself reminding them of these core principles that they've gotten away from. Yeah. And again, it's, 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 in most cases, it's not like, oh, man, I never heard of that idea. But it's like you said, they've got away from it. And having, uh, having a coach, having a manager, a parent, a friend, even themselves, where they're self-managing and, and like realizing, okay, I need to not just... I've gotten overly focused on my profession that can become really unhealthy where other very important parts of their life become neglected or, you know, someone gets too into it physically or whatever, you know, you can get pigeonholed on any one of them. Um, but yeah, that unhappiness comes when we're not really focusing on that, that overall, you know, if I can share a quote, there's a, a psychologist that I love. Yes. Many people have heard of her, Brene Brown. And I just, I can't help reading. I know you're like this too. And you find true principles like, oh my gosh, that's yeah, exactly right. you know, time tested. But, you know, just as in the psychological, she wrote a, a great book, uh, The Gift of Imperfection. Mm. And she said, a deep sense of love and belonging is an irresistible need of all people. We're biologically, cognitively, physically and spiritually wired to love, to be loved and to belong. And when those needs aren't met, we don't function as we were meant to. Yeah, absolutely. And so, and she's focusing on connection and love, but when you, when you have those areas and you don't feel connected, you're out of connection with them. You just are functioning below optimal human productivity level. And it doesn't take a whole lot to, to start increasing that productivity again, when you start paying attention and giving a little nod and a little daily effort to all four efforts of that fitness of factors. I don't mean to go into left field here, but you just triggered a thought. We all have the need for love, belonging, connection, and so forth. But I learned many years ago when I used to work with Tony Robbins that we also simultaneously have a need for significance or a, a desire to be significant in our own way. While the two go against each other, he would always say belonging and connection mean that we're one, we're together. But in that, some people lose their significance. And what significance means is that you have to separate, you have to stand out, you've got to be noticed. 
And so oftentimes we find ourselves in this inner civil war that sometimes these values and, and, and these areas of focus can, can get in the way of really striving to what we ultimately want. And, and I would just argue that sometimes we use the wrong vehicle to satisfy the need, right? Sometimes we trade what we want for the moment for what we want long-term and, um, and that can make, make things more difficult. Any, any yeah. thoughts on that? I know I kind of went out there, but. No, I, I, I think that there's a lot of obvious truth to that and it's got, we gotta be careful. I mean, progress from one point to another uh, to get from point A to point B, it, it always requires an exchange. Oh, you know, this like is good. I yes. Wait, I need to exchange maybe that big soda I'm drinking every day. Mm-hmm. Okay. But sometimes we start exchanging the wrong things. I want to get to point A, point B. So I'm going to spend more time at the office over a long time. That might get you success in the workplace, but then also really make the other area suffer. Maybe you're not getting to the right. gym. You're not dating your wife, your kid's relationship is suffering. And so it's, we got to be careful at what we're exchanging uh, you know, with those things you're saying are pulling against each other. Yeah. I want this. We want to make some improvements in advance, but you, we really need to be deliberate when we're strategizing of what is it that I'm going to exchange because we got to know that it comes with a cost and there's, that could be positive or negative. Mm-hmm. And, and so the idea of having a consultant or my book is to help people we- measure out and weigh yeah. what is it that I really want to exchange? How am I going to strategize to make this happen? in a healthy, productive, positive way. Yeah. And you brought up the story and you talked about in order to change, we must make an exchange. And you talked about the story of Tiger Woods and how he had to change. Did you, I think you said in the book, he had to change his swing multiple times, right? Would you explain a little bit of that? He started off. I mean, the story goes that he started off as a left-handed golfer, as like as a little kid. Yeah. And like had a great swing. And then the next day, you know, or sometime later, his, his dad said he just kind of went over to the other side, grabbed the club perfectly and had a beautiful right-handed swing. So change started early for him. And then throughout his career, I mean, arguably the best golfer or the second best golfer, if you, you know, however you want to, yeah. but in our generation, in our time frame, clearly the best. And even when he's been at the top of his game, he's chosen to like totally break down his swing. Now, sometimes it's been because of injury in his back and he had to, do things differently. But most of us, when we become successful, just start plateauing there. That's right. That's we, right. We don't do that. I, I'm reminded also, like maybe some of your listeners remember Hakeem Awajalon used to play yep. for the Rockets. You know, they asked him at the end of one season after winning the MVP, what do you want to do? He said, I want to learn to shoot with my left hand. And it's like, you're, you're the MVP, you know? And like, he's, I'm going I'm to learn to shoot with the other hand and be ambidextrous. And, and that's what these real high achievers do. They're, they never rest content with the championship or, or age, or, you know, a, a change in, you know, the business market. I'm sure a lot of our, your clients are going to have to change what they did or, or have had to change during this last six to nine months. Um, those that are succeeding have probably found a new market and a new method and are going to continue to progress others. Hey, this is what we've always done. And that's not always going to work through a pandemic or in a family or in a relationship. And so learning like Tiger did to have that courage, even when you're on top, to always be humble, accepting feedback, looking at, hey, what can we do to stay moving forward? That is a crucial key component to progression in life. Because there's going to be times when we get good at something and we, we just can't sit there thinking that that's, that same strategy is going to work in the next game we're in. That's true. And people have heard it on the podcast before. I know I've said it probably a dozen times. The easier it is to be good, the more difficult it is to be great, right? Because we do kind of come to this place, this plateau, as you say, contentness of, hey, I've done good. This is good enough. Well, what is good enough? If our potential is, we don't even know what our potential is. If it's true that we're only using a small portion of our brain, then I know that there's a human need to grow. And I find that people aren't growing, people that aren't setting goals, people that aren't actually pursuing living in alignment with these core values and, and needs, that they're not as happy. I think deep down, when you talk about this NBA player or you talk about Tiger Woods, there is that inner need to grow and to develop. And even when you get to the top of your game, you're always looking for a new way to grow and execute. And, and if you don't, I mean... Again, adaptation in sports or in life isn't always negative. Um, you know, when we, For sure. when we first go to 
to swing a golf club or something, you know, you could be in great shape, but you haven't done that motion and your back hurts and your shoulders like, man, this is a wimpy golf sport. Why am I so sore? Over time, you know, your body will get more accustomed to that load and you can swing a golf club without any problem. The, The challenge comes when adaptation becomes our crutch and like, Hey, I already know how to do this. And we, we adopt that mindset. This is just how I am. This has always worked for me, man. That is death to progress. That's right. Because even if it is effective or it has been, it may not be effective for this time. Mm. A, a moment ago, I said that, you know, the strategy for this game may not be the best for the next game. You ask Nick Saban or one of these college coaches, the way that they're going to prepare for old miss is going to be different than they prepare for Clemson. Mm. And it, they could be ranked the exact same, but they're going to run different plays, have different strengths, have different weaknesses. And if all you ever strategize for is for that one team and then try to use that against every other team, you, you probably aren't going to win at the per percentage you could otherwise. And so it has to be constant reevaluation, um, strategizing, identifying strengths and weaknesses of you know your competition or what you're working against, and then making those adjustments. And I'm not saying that we throw out everything you do. I mean, Tiger Woods swing is probably 99% the same, but those 1% tweaks yep. make a huge difference over time. Love it. You know, I came up many years ago, one o'clock in the morning, I woke up and came up with the BSA. This is 20 something. This is 20 years ago. The BSA results formula. And that's not for Boy Scouts of America. It's not a plug here. Is that it, right? Is it right. So I remember waking up saying all achievement and this is a whole person approach. This is my take on it. And, and you talk about strategy, I think, more than a lot of people do. And I think this is really powerful because I think this is where people get stuck. So the BSA results formula is that we have beliefs. That's the B, beliefs, mindset, motivation, self-esteem, right? Those things would fall into, the, fall into that. Then you have the competence or the knowledge and skills. And then you have, right, so that's going to be skills, S, and then A for action. So you have B, S, A. And so I think of it, I I always think of it as beliefs. The belief bubble is the heart, the skills or strategies area bubble is the mind. And then the action is the body. And the intersecting point in the middle there is what I call the fourth bubble instead of the three, the fourth, which is choice and conscience, which is the spiritual, right? You've got to have all those in place in order to ultimately get results, right? Because here's the thing, someone can believe, and this goes on to another chapter in your book that I want to get to, someone can believe that They have a lot of potential and believe they can make it happen and they can have the passion and the desire to go out there and the discipline to go do it. But if they don't have the right strategy or the right skills, it doesn't matter how much you believe or how much energy you put out there. You're not going to get the result that you want. Yeah. You know, I, I don't have scientific data to support this one, but I bet that that reason right there, you know, some you said someone has this great goal and this idea and yeah. even the energy to do it, but the discouragement of goals, why so many people kind of roll their eyes or get discouraged, even at the thought, Hey, let's strategize to some goals. Like, oh, you know, goals. It just makes me feel so bad. I'm so defeated. I get discouraged. It's because they don't take the time to set a strategy. Yes. And it's like, I, here's what I want. And, and they know it's attainable and they, and they write it down and that's great. But man, goal setting TJ shouldn't just I, I love the initial thought that comes and that's mm-hmm. probably right where we need to head. When we say, what do I want to do here? I want to do this. Boom. That's good. Right. But then the time that it takes to then develop a, a meaningful strategy of success is usually overlooked. Yep. We write it down in like 15 minutes. This is what came to my heart. Great. It's not just going to happen. It's not just going to happen on its own. And even the most well-intended, super you know, productive person unless they have some steps, That's exactly. unless they've really made a strategy of here's what my plan is going to be, man, those goals just fall to the wayside. Maybe some of them kind of naturally get hit upon just out of humans are awesome, but a lot of them fall short because that strategy taking, you know, planning time wasn't ever 
utilized and taken advantage of. And I just want to emphasize that you've got to get the strategy right. It just seems like that's I, 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 on a personal level. I think that's where the first five years of me building my business many years ago, when we were living in the basement of my parents' house, and I thought I'd only be there for two months that turned into five years. It was all strategy. It was all strategy. That was my mistake. Yeah. It had nothing to do with my will, my desire, my discipline, my willing to go out and face customers and sell myself. And all that was there, but I was moving in the wrong direction. And that was when I almost lost everything. And I wrote my first book in the backseat of my car. And then it was that switch in strategy that changed everything almost overnight. It was that switch, but I had to go to the other ends of the earth and around the moon, you know, like the Apollo mission before I could figure that out. And I hope that through what you're teaching and what I'm hoping to teach is that if you'll get the strategy right first and spend a little bit more time on that, which is boring and it takes thinking and it takes time, and, and you're right, you don't get the result right away. So you're wondering if it's really going to work, but you have to map that out. And then as best as possible, still being, a, you know, adaptable, stay focused on those steps and eventually it'll come, come through. And, and I think it's vital to one of the things you wrote down, you got to write it down anyway. Yes. You have a thought. Yeah, you know, I just I'm reminded of that, uh, you know, Alice in Wonderland, Lewis Carroll novel, and the Cheshire yes. Cat. Now, oh yeah, up, and you know, we've, we've heard this, but you know, which way do you want to go, Alice? Why? Well, or where do you want to go? I, I don't care. Well, it doesn't matter which road you take. Yeah, that's right. And and sometimes we take that same approach to the gym or to our profession or whatever. I, you know, where do you want to go? I, I don't know. Well, then you can take any road you want. That's You're right. going to get you know, I don't know or the the land of meadow of mediocrity pretty quickly mm-hmm. with that approach. So taking that time, and again, it's, that is, like you said, it's not always the exciting, glorious time. Like right. people love to write down four goals. Or a vision, or a vision, put a vision board together, right? Yeah, yeah I'm going to put, put all these pictures out. This is what I want. Okay, you probably can get there. But now the work is in, I got to make my workout program. And when I get to the gym, what am I going to do there? And how am I going to measure it? And That's what's right. going to help me stay feeling like I'm making progress, even on days in which I didn't have a good day at the gym or a good day at work. How am I going to chart mm. and know that I was successful and stay motivated toward that vision board that I, I think that's really good chart. I think, I think that that's really good too, because when you get the feedback of progress, that's what gives you a sense of progress. And when you get that sense of progress, you then have more motivation to keep going because now it's not just in this la la land in your imagination that you're achieving results, you're actually getting feedback from the actions that you take. And when you get that sense of progress and you won't know that unless you know what you're moving toward and you're able to reflect on, Hey, what are the check markers? Where, where am I at on my course? Where, right. And when you see all of a sudden you'll realize you're making progress. Right on. Yeah. And if you have that there, then you can see it and you stays motivated and you stay engaged hey, I am making progress. I'm not to point B yet that I wanted to get to, but I'm further past point A and I can see I'm headed toward the right direction. And I would say for the audience, it's in getting that feedback, whether it's tiny or whether it's big, doesn't matter. It's in that feedback and that feeling that you're making progress that gives you the added motivation to keep trying and to keep going and to not give up. You can't think your way to success. It has to be followed up with action. Okay, so your acronym, which we've kind of just touched on, more fit acronym. Yeah. Do you want to go over those? You want to go over those? Yeah. Okay, go yeah, ahead. I think it'd be good. I mean, there's so many ways to accomplish goals. And what I always tell people is, you know, if you've got something that works, then by all means, don't don't abandon it, you know, yeah, like, right. but at the same time, I found some of the most popular goal setting systems. Sometimes people don't find success in them because there's a couple of components that are missing. And uh, so I, I created one and it's in my, it's in my book yeah. and you know, more fit for the kingdom. And I, I call it the more fit goal setting strategy because yes. again, it, it needs to be a strategy. And like a, like a smart goal, it, it has some of those elements in there, but smart, you know, each letter has a meaning. Yes. And, uh, and so I, 
I kind of, I tell people when I'm working with them, you know, or individuals, organizations, you, you put that initial statement in it. It's like a funnel mm-hmm. and you're going to go through the more fit process. And when it comes out the other end, now you're going to have a really workable, actionable, attainable goal. Yes. But it's, it doesn't, it's not just one. And so I, I really encourage them, Hey, write down your thing. Now let's rewrite it and rewrite it and rewrite it. Mm-hmm. And that's the kind of step, but it takes time TJ. Right. I mean, but at, at the end, now they've got something that they can really sink their teeth into and move forward. Is it okay if I is it okay if I share what the acronym stands for? Yeah, absolutely. Go for it. Okay. Number one, measurable. It's got to be measurable. If you want to say anything, pause me and let me know. But measurable. I mean, that one I think is a you know, most goal setting strategies have something in there like, how are you gonna tell whether you've reached your goal? If you're losing weight, it's five pounds, you know. Yeah. What right. do you okay. okay? Number two, one wordable or one phrasable. This is key to me, TJ. And, and usually I, I kind of order these a little differently when I'm working with someone, this will be at the very end. But, oh, okay. Um, no, but keep going through them this way. But okay. I, once they've got their thing honed down, that's in this filter and it's coming out, you know, for people that are just listening, imagine a filter and at the very bottom, it's got a little plug or a little hole and the top's big. Once your goal has been refined to the point where you know some of these elements that TJ is going to go over, being able to one word or one phrase it is crucial because you can put it up on your phone, you can put it up on the wall and you can easily remember the goals in these four areas and be reminded of the strategy you've set. That's, you know, a, bit, a little bit longer. I would totally recommend looking at that on a regular basis too. But for me, like I set those on my phone home screen, people write them on sticky notes, but I just have little words or phrases that are a sermon in a sentence. I can look at it Huge. and go, okay, I remember my one word or one phrase and, and it's, it's a bigger concept, but I've really worked to adjust it, to hone it down. I know exactly what it means by the time I put it on my phone. Think about this. So if you study any athlete, you know that they do this. They'll have phrases that they say, let's get this. Let's go after, right? They, they, everyone has their own little mantra that they say. And um, I interviewed other authors like yourself that are in the sports arena as well. And they talk about really helping athletes get these phrases in their system for the, for the ordinary person out there listening to this though, I would say we all have an internal ad campaign and it's either positive or it's negative. You might already have the habit of saying a phrase that's not useful yeah. Like you make a mistake and you say, I'm such an idiot or that was stupid. Why pause, pause, slow down, notice what the phrases you already use at a, in, in a moment of frustration or um, in a moment of excitement, discover what those phrases are you already use and then improve upon them. Maybe replace it with something better. And what you, I'm assuming what you're saying is, you would want to make those phrases relative to the goals that you're setting, right? hundred percent and positive in that nature. Positive. Encouraging. Yes. You know, like my daughter's pitching right now in softball. She's just a little girl, but yep. from the stands, I can't say a whole lot, but we've worked on a lot of things at home. And so I just say, Hey, if I say this from the stands, this is what it means. And she, you can see her nod her head. I'm sure the coach is like, who's this clown in the stands that's barking at my girl pitching, but I can just, I know, Hey, this is what you need to do right here. And she, you know, nods and then she can make the adjustment. And that's the same thing. That's the purpose of the one word or phrasable goal is it quickly helps correct the course or keep you positive, keep you motivated toward the direction you wanted to head. And I think it can actually get you into that in in a moment's notice. It can get you into the state that you need to be in to make that change and have the energy to do so. So that's really good. All right. Number three, the goal should be part of your acronym here, more. More. So the R is realistic and reported. Explain that. Yeah. I think most people get realistic. You know, like a guy, I'm, I'm 5'10". I, I'm not doing a dunk from the free, three, you know, three oh, point yeah. line or free throw line. Okay. It's not happening. But so, you know, make it realistic and, you know, have a time, you know, that's going to be one of the other things here, but the reported is kind of a new one. Not everyone has that in their goal setting thing, TJ. And so like, if I'm working with you and, uh, and, I, and I say, TJ, I've got this goal. I want to get a new book out by the, by January 1st, mm-hmm. 2021. I've now put myself out there being vulnerable, being humble, being accountable. And I say, TJ, can you, I'm going to report back to you every week. And, and if I miss a week, will you call me back? And, and, and so now we're putting this component in where we're collaborating a little bit. We've, you know, usually a couple will do this with each other or a family with each other. It's awesome if employers do this with their employees. Hey, are there goals I could follow up on that you'd feel comfortable with that 
you think that would be helpful for you to make progress. That kind of step is, especially for some of these things that are hard, you know, like I'm trying to lose weight, I'm trying to gain strength, my, 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 you know, whatever it might be, having a reporting component can be a really help, helpful part to a person setting and achieving their goals. I agree. And, me, and that goes, it's in part, part of the measuring as well. But I will say, Tom, if you have any thoughts on this, yeah. be careful who you share your goals with. Yes, sir. Because, right, any virtue taken to the extreme, as one religious person once said, any virtue take, taken to the extreme can become a vice. And the problem is some people sh- throw out their goals to the whole world yeah. and they've left the fire out of the belly. When W. Clement Stone once said, make sure you only share your goals with people that have your best interest in mind and can help you achieve that goal, right? And someone that you trust. Well, and, and, and TJ, to kind of jump ahead to the next two. Yes, here, let's do it. Okay. You know, like we have the M is measurable. The O is one word or one phraseable. The R is realistic and reported. And I love that you're bringing up, we, we need to be careful. And like, these are sacred goals to us. These are special things that we've taken yeah. time. So Number f- the next two, I think, uh, you know, really go to your point. Oh yeah, there you got it. Yeah, emotionally connected is one. Yeah, we've got to make sure that's our, our goal. And then go ahead with the, that next one there. Fear, confronting, and flexible. Yeah, that flexible part, if we're not careful with who we've shared it to, we share it to the world and then, you know, hey, I'm going to do this this year, and then something happens, and then you got some Yahoo that's not you're not really connected to. Right. They're piling on. I mean, why didn't you get there? You know, what's your problem? And, and that's where people it can get very discouraging. I don't want to set goals, and people will know I failed. You know, if I don't get there, flexibility within a goal takes the failure part out for me. That, that's yes. like where I can adapt it. I can change it. This was an unforeseen variable. When I strategized, I tried to see all the variables. This is what I had no idea. COVID nineteen was going to hit the world. I can't get to the gym for four months. So yeah, I'm going to have to change my goal Hmm. or I had this sales goal at work in COVID-19. I I can't hit that, but I can still then readjust my goal, see what the principle of what it was, go back to it and go, okay, here's now what's flexible, what's realistic. Another one of the letters there. And and so these are some steps again, TJ, that sometimes are just skipped in goal setting. It's why people don't do it. It's true. Like it's not flexible. It's rigid. They're not emotionally connected to it. They haven't really ported. They don't have a buddy to help them that they can really trust and care about. Right. To help them get through it. Then number six is in writing. So put yeah. the goal in writing. Listen, I will say I love that you put that in there. I feel like a lot of people don't write enough about it. But if you go back 200 years and read about the classic books on achievement, every one of them says you have to write it down. There's something that connects the pen to the brain when you write it down. I don't know. It's just there's yeah. there's a power there old adage that the dimmest ink is better than the brightest memory. And yeah. we just, we're humans. We just can't hold on to it. But if you have it there, you're looking at it, it's on your phone, it's on a, on your mirror, whatever you're, you're seeing it in your car, your office, write it down, get after it. Right. Very, very good. And then the last one is number seven, uh, which is the end of more fit, which is the T is timely and tied to an action. Yeah. Most people get the time component, but they don't then, and, and sometimes my one word or one phrase is very similar to that action word. I, when I help people set goals, like what's the action that's going to mm-hmm. get you, you know, closer to that goal. And so kind of figuring out that, that bit of the strategy of what, what's the action that I need to go. And oftentimes, again, that ends up being the one word or part of the one word or one phrase that they, they choose. Okay. So this is awesome. And I hope everybody gets your book more fit for the kingdom where they can really break down. You share so many great stories in the book that back up the principle, which is really beautiful. But I save this for the last. And it's the story about Milo Croton. Am I saying his name right? I'd say it Milo of, of Croton, but Croton Croton. really I, advanced. So you might, hey. you might <laughs> yeah. No, it's awesome. But let me, re- let me read this because I love this. And I think there's a life principle here, a parent and child principle, which I'll explain in a second, but it's powerful. So you say it's called the overload principle, right? Is the basic concept behind all workouts in order for a muscle to increase in strength, it must be gradually stressed by working against a load greater than it is accustomed to. 
To increase endurance, muscles must work for a longer period of time than they are used to or to a higher intensity. As a result, the body's various systems adjust and increase their capacity to perform physical work. Over time, one can improve their physical strength, endurance, quickness, or agility by gradually increasing their workload. I love that. And what the thought that triggered for me was Roger Bannister breaking the four minute mile. It's a great example. Of that. Here was a guy who could run fast, but until they started to click him each time he went around the track, he began to work on one leg of that four minute until he got that below a minute and then did all four. And it's, a, it's, you know, it's, it's yeah. pretty powerful, but he had to push himself even at a granular level harder than he had ever pushed himself prior to. And it was then that we realized he had more capacity, was able to break that long-term mental barrier, if you will. Any thoughts around this? Oh, I love it. And and I think I read it in your book, actually, TJ. I think you may have mentioned him. I that, did, uh, yeah. his, coach, his coach did a whole different type of training with him. And it wasn't just running where it was tradition, but the whole body strengthening, which it definitely applies to, you know, more fit for, for life where exactly. you can't just focus on one area. But yeah, you know, the story for your listeners, if they're not familiar with Milo of Croton, or as you would say, no, no. <laughs> <laughs> but uh Milo is awesome. We don't know if he's an actual person. Maybe he was, or the story's a myth, but you know, ancient times, this guy was, uh, he was, a, a, you know, the best wrestler and um, the way he got his strength as myth or legend or history goes is that when he was a little boy, his dad gave him a, um, a calf that would grow into a bull. I, I'm not very good with my farm animals, but a, a small bull, whatever that is, a calf, I think. And he said, Hey, put it on your shoulders and uh, you know, run up the hill in the backyard every day and come back. And so he did, it was a relatively easy task at first, you know, for a young Milo and the young calf, but over time, the calf keeps eating, Milo keeps growing, but you know, the calf's going to be five, six, 700 pounds. And Milo is daily taking him up and down this hill. And uh, the, the idea there, this is where really all workouts kind of get their footnote from and, and what they're about is progressive overload. Milo was able to do it because it was only incremental weight every day. And it wasn't like some big thing, but from a boy to a man, he became so strong and developed this press, progress, you know, impressive strength because he had this progressive overload. So you'll see it in the gym. And again, that's one of the principles that caught me early on, TJ, when I was in college and, and people were trying to gain strength. And, and it was seemingly so elusive to do it in the spiritual world or the professional world. And especially in our day, TJ, everyone wants success like that. Yep, yeah. And, uh, but this is what something I saw, well, Hey, we're, if an individual set a goal and had a plan and a strategy and we're tracking and measuring, mm -hmm. you, know, you can gain impressive amounts of strength. I joked earlier that I, I can't dunk from the, from the free throw line, but I know I could become a lot closer to dunk, you know, maybe not from the free throw line, but period, I could do it. If I engaged in a series of exercises that worked on my leaping ability you know, at 43 years old, that's not really that important to me to dunk anymore, TJ. So I'm not really focused on that. But people who have goals can use that same principle, whether it's with their spouse or at their employment, um, in college, in their religion, to make gains to get closer to the fitness level that they want. So I just want to add here, agreeing with everything that you've said, is that on this principle, we should not be afraid of doing hard things. I've tried to teach my children. I have two that have grown up and moved out of home. I still have two daughters at home. In order for them to achieve greatness in life, I believe a parent has to allow that child to grow. And sometimes that means doing things they don't feel they're capable of doing, only to realize they are capable of doing it. And I'll just share a quick story. There was, for a little time period, I was a scout master for the Boy Scouts. And I said, I was always this guy who was a survivalist. When I was younger, man, I thought I could be Rambo. I thought, listen, I thought I could go survive out in the wild. So I was one day chatting with all the boys, these 12, 
13, 14, 15 year olds. And I said, how would you guys like to do a survival camp out? And all these boys are like, yeah, we'd love to do it. I said, well, what is that going to look like? What are we going to do? If it's truly going to be a survival camp out, that means you can't have food. That means we have to live off the land. What does that look like? And I remember a guy I knew said, hey, up in Washington, you hike up this, the switchbacks about four miles. You get on top. There's four lakes, Mildred Lakes up in Washington. There's a ton of fish in those lakes. And so I thought, okay, how about we all hike? And this is what we'll do. It'll be a three-day camping trip. And during that three days, you're allowed to bring the last day food for the last day, but no one's allowed to eat food for two days. Now, we had a lot of leaders involved that if it was going to be a dangerous thing or someone couldn't write whatever, we, we had all precautions all laid out. Yeah. So, yeah. so we weren't going to put anybody in harm's way. But there were some parents that said, no way am I going to allow my kid to do that. But let me tell you, out of this group, we had probably 17 boys do it. We hiked up and it was harder than I even thought. You ate I watched these boys eat all the berries hiking up in the mountains. They ate every berry. I taught them how to catch squirrels and gut them and actually cook them. They caught a few squirrels. I, we, I was hoping that we'd have a big feast once we got up there and everybody started fishing. They, I mean, they were starving at that point. It took seven hours or something to hike up to camp. And they, these are boys. They haven't eaten. The, it's just horrible. And I thought, man, they will all, half of the boys just put up their tent and went to sleep. Their way of surviving was just to ignore it and go to sleep. And hopefully tomorrow would be better couple boys went out to fish, didn't get anything. I remember hearing all the moans and the groaning, you know, throughout the day. And I remember that first night we slept and I was worried for these boys. Now, granted, we had food and things that we could give them, but I wanted to push them past the point of what they thought was possible without truly harming them. And we were really mindful. And I remember I woke up the next morning at 5 a.m. and I thought, I'm going to go out and fish. Maybe I'll catch some fish early in the morning. I get out there. There's already two of the older boys already out there fishing. They've caught nothing. Uh -oh. I said a little prayer to get spiritual or anything, but I said a little prayer in my heart. Please help me use, help me have success out here to teach these boys a principle. Number one, that they can do hard things, but then also that we can be blessed if we'll get out and take the action that's necessary. And I remember these two boys that were out on the lake early that morning didn't catch anything. And all of a sudden I threw out the line and I got a fish. I threw out the line again. I got a fish. I threw out the line. I got like 10 fish. I remember taking all 10 of those fish. It was like my Moses moment. I walked back from that, from that lake. I woke everybody up and I said, I got breakfast for everybody and everybody cooked it. And it was just a beautiful thing. And Although it was hard, and these boys said it was the hardest thing they had ever done. Nobody starved. Nobody got hurt. We had enough food, although they did starve a little bit. And then they were able to eat that last meal. And then I think I brought a bunch of fun food for them to have and so forth at the end. And we hiked back down. But weeks later, those boys told me they learned that they were tougher than they thought they were. And I think, I know I went a little long on that. But I think as we push people to do hard things like this, Milo, I just, if we, as we help people see the vision, let me put it this way. So it's not a push thing. It's a pull thing. It's a give you the vision and then set you free. And, and when people are put on the line to do something hard, I believe that is where self-esteem is improved, not weakened right? As long as they have one of your points is the flexibility, right? Yeah. The adaptability. And, and I think there's power in pushing people beyond their limits. Your yeah. thoughts? Yeah, I think that, you know, as people are trying to make progress, and one of the major emphasis is I wanted to make in my book was that it doesn't have to be negative. There's going to be failure along the way. We yes. need to embrace that. Embrace as, it. I mean, some of these kids didn't catch fish at first. You need to embrace that failure as part of the process, not just to be expected, but accepted. And as we're moving through this process, those little failures become the success 
successful, you know, stepping stones to the place where we wanted to go. It, it, whether, it, you know, a golfer learning to improve his swing or a basketball player is shot, as we fail in efforts to succeed, it, there really isn't a failure unless we quit. Yes. And that's where in my book, I tie it back in with, with Lindsay Jacobella. She did something that a lot of people would, would call, you know, just, I'm done. Like, this is embarrassing, mm-hmm. humiliating. Like, I, I blew it. And instead, she's gone back. She's won X game gold after X game gold. She's qualified for the Olympics three more times. Um, that's an amazing accomplishment. And so she is like the more fitter that I try to highlight at the end of my book. And there's some more reasons there that I provide, but she shows that resilience. She's a goal setter. She hasn't let a a single failure define who she is, nor should we, as we're trying to become more fit for the office or more fit for the family or more fit for the kingdom, whatever we're working toward, there's going to be failures along the way. And so as we just add a little bit of weight, we adapt, we modify, we're flexible. We have that vision and we move toward it we'll find that we do become more fit for our life. And uh, that's the message that I, I really try to bring up hope of positivity of goal setting can be so motivating and enriching to our lives as we achieve greatness that we, we previously was unattained for us. Love it. The book is titled more fit for the kingdom. Go get a copy. It is a bestseller on Amazon. It has a lot of reviews People are loving it. I loved reading it because it does have that positive feeling, a feeling of hope, right? Hope with a strategy is what you provide people. And, um, and I hope they can read it and find the ba- how to find that balance in their own lives. How can people get a copy of your book? Yeah, thanks, DJ. Yeah, it's on Amazon. You know, just search more fit for the kingdom. And um you know, TJ and I have hinted at it. This is a book that's helping people gain spiritual strength. So I want yes. you to know that heading in. Yep. The principles would apply, you know, across the board. But, you know, this was designed to help people gain what was elusive, their spiritual strength. And so um, there's, it's a kind of a workbook type of, uh, of read, practical applications and questions to ask yourself, and then charts that you can use to measure. Right now, TJ, um, coinciding with this uh, Unleash Your Greatness Within podcast, for the rest of November, we're, we're just wanting to show our gratitude. We, this book become a bestseller. It's blown us away. There's been a lot of negative things that have happened in 2020. Mm-hmm. This book's been a major positive. And my favorite feedback that I'm getting is that people are saying what we've just shared, you know, this positive approach. I feel like I'm empowered to go get some things that I hadn't before. I, I've got a better outlook at it. And so we're reducing the price throughout November, kind of a Black Friday through November. Uh, the paperback is 844. So I'm trying to use these components of the, of the number four, more fit for oh, the yeah. Kindle. And then 444 for the ebook. And which if you get it, you just download the Kindle app and it's free and you know, and you can do it. So that's huge. We'd love for you to check it out. Maybe it's a Christmas present. Maybe it's something for you. And, uh, you know, there's more of information on it there if you want to look at it and see what it's about. But uh, really really been grateful that that people have found progress from it in in on development for sure and the principles are solid and so i stand by your book and endorse it it's powerful book i it's just powerful any other thing they should know in terms of connecting with you are you on instagram anything like that yeah i try to i try to post on instagram just little thoughts like this that sometimes they're business focused or family focused or spirituality folk you know just kind of one of the four areas. I try to post three or four times a week and that's at, at more fit for life. At more yeah. fit for life. Okay. Yeah, that's kind of the bigger brand. Uh, the more fit for the kingdom was just the spiritual part portion yeah. of that. But, uh, more at more fit, the number four life on Instagram. Would love to have you follow, have you follow me there and uh, just put out meaningful, helpful content to, you know, with a positive approach to developing wholeness in those areas. Wow, this interview was really meaningful. Thank you. Sky for yeah. being on the show is awesome. And it's an honor. I know your guest list is just fantastic. And to be here with you, TJ, and, and these other previous guests is, is a real honor. So thanks for having me. My pleasure. 